Greetings friends, my name is Lucas Mann and I come out here with my friend Steve and our friend Dallas and uh, we come out here friends for a very specific purpose and it is to share the good news of Jesus Christ with you to share with you the message of life uh, for we know that Jesus himself said for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost see friends man by default is lost he is separated from God and at enmity and war with God and if he is to ever live at peace with God and is it to ever go to heaven when he dies he must be reconciled to God but reconciliation with God requires the shedding of blood it requires someone to bear the wrath of God against them on behalf of the sinner in question and so we find in Scripture that the Bible says Jesus died upon the cross as a propitiatory sacrifice that is he bore the wrath of God for the sins of his people and so there is hope in Christ and so this evening we with great earnestness and great urgency point you to the Savior the Lord Jesus Christ we point you to Christ because we understand that he is the only way of salvation that is an exclusive way there is one mediator between God and man the man Christ Jesus there is only one no man no priest no pastor can stand between you and God friends you will either on the day of judgment appear before God covered by the mediation of Christ or standing to your own defense but there will be no defense to given for as Paul writes in Romans 3 for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and as we know as is highlighted in Scripture your own conscience tells you of that reality your own conscience reminds you of your own faultiness of your sin against God so we have bad news to bring certainly we do the reality of man's sin before God is bad news however we bring that cure the only cure the only remedy for man's plight and that is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as my brother just read from Romans 1 Paul writes for I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God it is the dunamis of God it is the explosive life-changing power of God unto salvation and so friends that is the message that we seek to make known to you this evening we're not here to preach health wealth and prosperity we're not here to make ourselves known or to bring glory to ourselves but rather to Christ who once for all obtained eternal redemption by his own death upon the cross and through his resurrection and through his ascension and his exaltation and his perfect life of obedience And so may he be glorified as his gospel is made known this evening and may God in his sovereign mercy draw a people to himself through his son so the text of scripture that I would like to highlight before you this evening is found in Romans chapter 4 in Romans chapter 4 in verse 14 the Apostle Paul is writing here and he says this and the context of this verse he's talking about Abraham who was an Old Testament patriarch who was saved by faith alone in Christ and Paul here is talking about the descendants of Abraham here's what he says in verse 14 for if those who are of the law are heirs faith is made void and the promise is nullified for the law brings about wrath but where there is no law there is also no violation and that's what I would like to make known this evening the nature of the law of God and its function its function Paul really highlights its function there in verse 15 that it brings about wrath 
And friends, Paul tells us in the book of Galatians that the law of God is our schoolmaster. It's our tutor that leads us to Christ. It shows us our need for Christ. Also, Paul in these two verses discusses the nature of the law of God in regard to the membership of the covenant of grace. Who are the partakers of the covenant of grace? Who are the partakers of the new covenant of salvific blessings in Christ? And here we see that Paul clearly highlights that it is not those who are born according to the flesh, but those who are born again of the Spirit. Who are born again of the Spirit. But going back to what I was saying a moment ago concerning God's law, bringing about wrath. As I mentioned, Paul says it is our tutor that leads us to Christ. Dear friends, man is inherently prideful and inherently self-affirming. In fact, what we will do is justify ourselves in our sin, pointing to others who are worse off than ourselves and thereby declaring ourselves to be okay with God. In fact, man does not want to come to grips with this reality and this truth that he is a sinner, that he has broken God's law. In fact, we know that the Scripture says, God is opposed to the proud but gives grace to the humble. And we are all inherently born with this great pride that keeps us from admitting that which we know to be true. That... We are imperfect, but it is beyond simply imperfection. It is that we ourselves are dead in sin and altogether haters of God. That we indulge the passions and desires of the flesh and of the mind. That we are by nature children of wrath. And that we do not care for the things of God. And if you're honest with yourself and you examine your own life, you'll see that if you are outside of Christ, this is the state in which you are in. This is the state in which you live. If you do not know Christ, if you have not been born again of the Holy Spirit, then friends, you likewise are dead in sin. And so God gives His law which shows us His character, which outlines for us what God's moral standard is. And that very law which shows us God's character shows us also our character in comparison to His and how woefully inadequate we truly are and how desperately we are in need of saving grace. Saving grace. Not a grace that comes alongside of us and helps us to be righteous before God but rather a grace that transforms us from the inside out. A grace that saves us sovereignly. That is the grace of which I speak. And this grace of God is only revealed in the Gospel. And so friends, I exhort, I plead with you to believe the Gospel of Jesus Christ. To put all your hope and confidence before God in the finished work of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to reject the testimony of man where it defers from the testimony of God. For there are many religious groups, sadly, in the world that proclaim a way of salvation, but all of them in one way or another, aside from biblical Christianity, proclaim that the way of salvation is by man's effort, whether it be by half of God's work or half of man's, or even some may say 90% of God, but still 10% of man. But rather the Scriptures come and say it is all of God because God is jealous for the glory. And so friends, that is why Christ says that you must deny yourself and take up your cross and come after Christ. To deny oneself is to abandon any self-reliance. Any self-reliance. And instead relying upon Christ for salvation and life eternal. So friends, though I may say things this evening that offend you and upset you, please know that they are said in love and that they are only from the Scriptures. I only say what the Scriptures say.
I'm not up here to preach to you conjecture or the wisdom of man, but rather what the Word of God has already spoken. And friends, know that the truth which I speak, though it may wound you, is there ultimately for your good and for your benefit. I would much rather wound you with the truth for a temporary set of time, knowing that it could bless you over the long run, than comfort you temporarily with lies and ultimately bring upon you eternal destruction. There are many so-called preachers and pastors who stand in pulpits in America and make known a gospel that is comfortable to people. That's why they're able to amass these large crowds. We have Joel Osteen, for example, in Houston, Texas, largest Protestant church in America, 47,000 people in attendance. Friends, there's a reason why there are so many people around this man, because he preaches a gospel that is comfortable and easy to listen to. I could go on and on. T.D. Jakes, Joyce Meyer, these are false teachers. And they don't want to tell their hearers things that they don't want to hear because they'll lose money, fame, and popularity. And people will think less of them. But friends, I'm willing to be seen as a fool in public for your sakes that you might hear the truth of the Gospel. That blessings from heaven would rain down upon your soul. That Christ might be formed in you, which is the hope of glory. God bless you. Thank you, ma'am. And so I want to discuss and I want to make known the nature of God's law, which will ultimately lead us to consider the work of Christ who Himself fulfilled the law of God, which is a glorious reality that I will speak of later. But the context of this verse, very briefly, as I mentioned, was Paul here talking about Abraham and Abraham's descendants, and who are the members of this covenant of grace, of these glorious promises that were given to Abraham? Who are the, the rightful owners, we might say, of these promises that God gave to this servant of His? And Paul says in verse 14, as I just read, that it is not those who are of the flesh. Those are not the ones who are the heirs. But rather it is those who are of the faith of Abraham. For he says in verse 13, For the promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Abraham received this promise from God, this great and glorious promise, by faith. In fact, we find that just a few months ago, October 31st of 2017, marked the 500-year anniversary of the Protestant Reformation where men of God, led by the Spirit of God, stood for the truths of Scripture in the face of persecution by the Roman Catholic Church. And one of the truths that the Reformers stood upon was sola fide, which is faith alone, that we are reconciled to God by faith in Christ alone, that it is not faith plus works, or just merely works on their own, rather it is faith, faith in Christ. In fact, that is why I exhort, I plead with you to place your faith and your confidence in Christ alone. For if there is any ounce of self-confidence within you, if there is any reliance upon your own merits for salvation, then friends, you're hopelessly lost. Lost without Christ. So after reading verse 13, that brings us to the beginning of verse 14. So let's consider the nature of God's law. Verse 14, For those who are of the law are heirs. For if those, excuse me, who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void and the promise is nullified. Oh, dear friends, this is why one of the errors that are often propagated by dear friends of mine called the Presbyterians is so vain. Because those who are of the flesh are not partakers of these glorious promises. They have no right to them. Rather, it is for those who are of the faith of Abraham. As he says there, if, you, if, if those who are of the law are heirs of these glorious promises, 
then faith means nothing. If salvation is something that could be obtained by birth or by your ethnic placement in society, then it would be vain to conceive of faith. But as it stands, my friends, God has spoken in His Word and has said that we can only approach Him through faith in Christ. Faith in Christ alone. Not faith in who we were born to or in what religion or what race we were born into because the idea of race is a, is a lie. It's heresy. Nowhere does the Bible even support the idea of race. All people are made from two ancestors, Adam and Eve. In fact, the idea of race is an evolutionary, atheistic idea. And sadly, in its name have many atrocities been committed, have many evils been accomplished. So Paul says that in verse 14, showing that the idea of salvation through birthright undercuts salvation by grace. You want, you want there is no uh, there's yeah, right, right there. If you have a question, we actually have a microphone. You have a question, sir? Hey, shout out to me and my boy. We out here. You feel me? Yeah, Do you have any? Well, we 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 reserve the microphone if you have a question about God or theology or anything of that of that nature. Yeah. Hey, what's? Hey, shout out to y'all doing y'all thing out here. Shout out to them. Hey, you already got a question? <laughs> and then five bucks for using the mic. Right, you want a jewel? You want a jewel? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's good. Cheers, guys. Have a good night. I believe in God, though. Yeah. Right, keep going, right? Yeah. So just, just next time. <laughs> I yeah. didn't know if you. I didn't know what your rule is about the mic. No, so. no, no, dude, that's fine. No. Like, if they I was question, just gonna let him say what he ever wanted, as no. long as he wasn't cursing or anything. No, if he's got a question, <laughs> otherwise, say, dude, okay. you don't have a question. Right, just bring your own mic. Okay. <laughs> yeah, dude, five dollars. Five dollars for you. You could turn it off here too. Okay, thank you, thank you. That's right. No, you did good. Yeah. Well Dear friends, we just so you know, we do have actually a microphone set up here. If you have any questions about the things of God, certainly we are zealous and ready to answer. And uh, even if you think we're absolute nut jobs, we greatly invite you with, with great anticipation to come and to make your concerns known to the whole uh, world out here in the open air as we're preaching. We have this microphone set up for a reason. So please do, we invite you. But going to verse 15, and this is what I really want to highlight and stress here. He says, For the law brings about wrath. And really, this, mean, this text is, is kind of a twofold meaning, we might say. The law brings about wrath in the sense that those who break God's law incur or bring about upon themselves the punishment, the wrath of God that they deserve for having broken God's law. But also, the law of God brings about wrath in the sense that it shows us that we deserve the punishment for our sin. It's not that it just objectively brings about our needing to be punished because of our sin, but it shows us what our sin is. What have we done specifically against God? For we find in His law that God has said, you shall not lie or steal or blaspheme God's name or commit adultery. But friends, we find that our hearts are prone and bent and set on doing these things that God Himself forbid man from doing. And that's why the law brings about wrath. It's not that the law itself has an inherent issue. In fact, we know from the Psalms that the law of God is perfect. From Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The commandment of the Lord is pure. God's laws are gloriously perfect and in no way have a flaw. The issue comes in with our inability to keep them. That's where the problem comes in. In fact, we live in a nation, praise be to God, that we live in a nation that's moral fabric and moral structure has been built upon the Ten Commandments, which are the law of God. For America used to be very much favorable toward Christians toward Christianity. Sadly, it's becoming less and less that way. 
So God's law is not the issue. It, the issue is in our inability to keep it. And so therefore our trust must be in the one who through a life of perfect obedience, Christ Jesus, please the Father. We know from Matthew chapter 3, verse 17 that the Father spoke audibly from heaven and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Christ, through His active obedience, has procured a perfect righteousness to give to all those who will ever believe on His name. And speaking of the name of Jesus Christ, the Scripture says, The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. That is a promise from God which shall never fail. Verse 15, Paul then says, But where there is no law, there is also no violation. In other words, if the law is not there, there's no violation. But as it stands, God's law has been given. And even to those who have never heard of the name of Jesus Christ and have never heard of the Bible, still have the light of nature, still have general revelation to go by and still have the conscience which testifies to them as to what is right and what is wrong. Certainly it is true that they do not know all that they need to know for salvation, but they know enough to be without excuse. As the Baptist Catechism says, question three is, how do we know that there is a God? And the answer is, the light of nature in man and the works of God plainly declare that there is a God, but His Word and Spirit only do effectually reveal Him unto us for our salvation. So every man is held accountable by God. Those who have never heard of the law of God, according to the light of nature in which they've lived, they are held accountable. And to their own consciences, they are held accountable. And to the full law of God, they are held accountable. And for those who certainly have heard of the things of God, have heard of the Gospel, know the law of God, their breaking of it certainly is held accountable by God. They themselves are held accountable by Him. Friends, God, this God who authored this law, upon whose character the law of God is built, is a holy God. We know that Isaiah wrote in Isaiah 6, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We know the book of Leviticus repeatedly declares to us the holiness of God. In fact, there is no other attribute in all the Bible that is so repeatedly referenced and so often marked out and highlighted than the holiness of God. And that is not accidental, as it were. That is not unintentional. But that is intentional. In God's providence, He ordered it to be that way. He wanted by bringing about the written Word for man to understand how holy He is. To be holy is to be separate, to be cut apart. It is true that God is gracious, that God is abounding in loving kindness and truth. As we know from Exodus, as we know from the Psalms, as we know from the book of 1 John, we know from 1 John that God is love, but He is holy. And friends, do not take the attributes of God that seem most pleasing to you and most comfortable to your flesh. Rather, we must deal with God as He reveals Himself to us in His Word. In fact, if we are to fashion a God according to our own likeness and desires, and according to our own passions and lusts, then what we have done is we have broken the first commandment, which is to not commit idolatry, to not worship false gods. So God in His holiness reveals His wrath from heaven. 
Paul says that in Romans 1.18, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. In the book of Nahum, one of the smaller prophets in the Old Testament, Nahum chapter 1, verse 2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries and He reserves wrath for His enemies. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwind and storm is His way, and clouds are the dust beneath His feet. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He dries up all the rivers. Bashan and caramel wither, or caramel wither. The blossoms of Lebanon wither. Mountains quake because of Him, and the hills dissolve. Indeed, the earth is upheaved by His presence. The world and all the inhabitants in it. Who can stand before His indignation? Who can endure the burning of His anger? His wrath is poured out like fire, and the rocks are broken up by Him. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and He knows those who take refuge in Him. But with an overflowing flood, He will make a complete end of, his, of its sight, and will pursue His enemies into darkness. Whatever you devise against the Lord, He will make a complete end of it. Distress will not rise up against twice. Will not, not rise up twice. Friends, this is the character of God. This is the One who created all things, both you and I, who spoke and the heavens were created at once, who formed the earth, and the waters upon the face of the earth and the land and the animals and man from the dust of the earth and woman out of the side of man and placed them there in that garden and entered into a covenant of works with them, forbidding him to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil upon condition of perfect obedience. And if they were to break that covenant of works, then they would be eternally condemned and all of Adam's posterity, all of Adam's descendants would be condemned in Him. Friends, that was the first revelation of the holy character of God and the law of God in the garden. And Adam, as you know, fell and broke God's command and therefore he and his wife Eve fell Sin entered the world. Creation is now fractured and now tainted by the entrance of sin into it. And all of Adam's descendants and all of Adam's posterity are fallen in Him and are born with that original sin, that nature of enmity toward God. That is why we are in the place that we are in, friends. Because our Father, the Father of the human race, the federal head of the human race, who represented you and me and every person who was to ever live in that garden, could not keep God's law. Well, I should say that he, it's not that He could not keep it. It's that He chose to disobey it. For we know that God had endowed Him in holiness and righteousness, and he had the ability to obey God, but he chose, having been deceived by the serpent, to disobey God. But friends, the last Adam has come. Christ, representing all of his elect people in his life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, exaltation, through his work, through his atonement, Christ has obtained eternal redemption for his church. Friends, the last Adam has come who stands as the representative for the people of God. And therefore, if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation, as Paul says in Romans chapter 8, verse 1. And later on, we know that in human history, God gave the law of God, the Ten Commandments, which is simply a republication of what was given in the garden, 
at Mount Sinai, where as I mentioned, God says you shall not lie, steal, commit adultery, blaspheme, commit idolatry. And as I said, have said already, we practice these things by default because of our sin nature. We are liars and thieves and dead in sin and in need of saving grace. And because of this law-breaking, because of our being in sin and under the representation of Adam, dead in Adam, we are condemned before God. That's why it says in Nahum 1.6, His wrath is poured out like fire. God's wrath is against the wicked. God's wrath is revealed from heaven against the wicked. This is true. This is true, friends. What do we want to hear? What do, what do people think of when they think of God? Do they think about His holiness or His righteousness? Often, what do they conceive of? A cosmic grandfather, as it were, in the sky, or a genie in a bottle. That you just, you just do it, just say a couple words, and God will dispense blessing upon everyone. Like a vending machine. 24-7. But friends, is God at our command like that, or are we under His command and His rule and His authority? Friends, it is the second way around. We are under God's rule and sovereign dominion. And therefore, man is headed for destruction by default. All those who are outside of Christ are headed for hell, the place that Jesus spoke of more than He did about heaven. Friends, I do not say this out of my own imagination. If you read the New Testament, you'll find that in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus mentioned hell more than He did heaven. And the reason was, was not because He was trying to be cruel, but out of love for those to whom He was speaking. And out of, a, an, out of an evangelistic zeal, the Lord Christ warns them of impending judgment. Friends, the one who loves you the most is the one who tells you the most truth. I want to tell you the truth. The truth is that if you know not Christ, you're headed for destruction. Eternal torment. But friends... God was pleased to enact a covenant of grace. After Adam and Eve fell in the garden, God spoke to the serpent who deceived the man and the woman, saying that the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. And we know that the Father was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would come into the world and would obliterate and destroy and absolutely reverse the work of Satan. Jesus Christ is the seed of the woman. We know that as Revelation progressed, as time went on, God revealed to Abraham that in his seed all the nations of the world would be blessed. We know that he was speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we know that Christ would be the descendant of Abraham. Then later we find that David... Israel's greatest king was promised a son who would reign upon his throne forever and ever. And we know that that is Jesus Christ. So we find later on that Christ was to be king over God's kingdom and would be the son of David. And then we find as time goes on, Jesus enters into the world. Christ bursts onto the stage of history coming to save God's elect people, those whom the Father predestined to save. And Jesus came and fulfilled the law of God in His perfect life. We know that He says in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. So He lived obediently to God's law and thereby procured for us a perfect righteousness. That is a righteousness that we could be given and wrapped in to stand before God with so that God would see us as perfect in His sight. And then Christ Jesus suffered and bled and died a horrible, torturous death and suffered unimaginable pains in His soul and bore the wrath of God against the sins of His people. That is how much Jesus Christ loved His bride. I love what Paul says in Ephesians 5, 
Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Friends, Jesus Christ has loved his bride with a love that we cannot comprehend, a love that compelled him to suffer under the infinite holy wrath of the Father so that she herself would be made holy, harmless, and undefiled, that she herself would enter into heaven. Isaiah 53, 11 says, As a result of the anguish of his soul, he will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many. Jesus, Jesus Christ, through his death, justified the many. The wrath of God was thereby satisfied. And three days later, He was vindicated by God the Father. For Jesus did not die as a guilty man, rather as an innocent man regarded as guilty, so that those who are guilty might be regarded as innocent. Friends, Christ became poor, that sinners might be made rich in eternal blessings. Christ suffered horrible sorrows, that we might have eternal joy. Christ carried the cross to Calvary that sinners might be given a crown of righteousness in heaven. Darkness fell upon the land as Christ was upon the cross so that sinners could enter into the glorious lights of heaven and see God who is Himself light, who dwells in unapproachable light. And so in light of the work of Christ, the call of the Gospel is that we repent and believe it. Repentance is simply seeing our absolute inability to please God on our own and in and of ourselves, our utter inability to do anything righteous in the sight of God. And faith is being convinced of the, the efficacy, the power of the promises of God, specifically in relation to the Lord Jesus Christ. And faith is is looking to Christ. Looking to Christ for salvation. For salvation. Therefore, for all who repent and believe the Gospel, God forgives them of all sin, past, present, and future, and wraps them in the righteousness of His Son. And they are credited with having lived His life because He was credited with having lived their, theirs. Salvation by grace, friends. Grace. Grace means unmerited favor. Ephesians 2.8, For by grace you have been saved through faith. Through faith. And for those who have been saved, they've been given a new heart with new desires. And they are changed. They are, they are born again. They now hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves. Because they've been saved by His grace. And ultimately, it is for His own glory. That's the end to this great salvation. That's the end of all things. All things have been made not for man. This world was not made for us. You and I were not made for you and I. We were made to live to the glory of God. As the Baptist Catechism says in question 2, what is the chief end of man? Answer, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy Him forever. And so it is to His glory. So may Christ be brought all glory in all things. I exhort you who know not the love of Christ to repent and to believe the Gospel, to deny yourselves and take up your cross and come after Christ. If you know Christ, I encourage you to make known the Gospel to those who are around you who are lost. And if you say you're a Christian, I want to exhort you to examine yourself, for there are many hypocrites. And if you are a hypocrite, repent and believe the Gospel. And so we've seen here in Romans 4, verses 14 and 15, the nature of the law of God. That those who are of the law are not inheritors of God's promises, specifically speaking of the, the descendants of Abraham, but those who are of the faith of Abraham. It's not what family you're born into, 
that makes you right with God, it's faith in Christ. And the law of God shows us our need for Christ. For He came into the world to save sinners. And all who believe Him are saved by His grace and for His own glory. To the Father, to the Son, to the Spirit, to the one true God, be all glory, praise, and honor forevermore. Amen. Amen.